Thank you for joining California Competes' 10th anniversary interview series. Today, I'm sitting down with U.S. Department of Education Undersecretary James Qual. James Qual provides leadership for the Biden-Harris administration on bringing the post-secondary reforms of the administration into fruition. Undersecretary Qual is an equity champion and has decades of experience tackling higher education issues across the nation. He previously served in the U.S. Department of Education and the White House under the Obama administration, where he worked on tightening for-profit regulations and establishing a plan for free community college. He also helped organize the White House Summit on College Opportunity, which brought together more than 100 college presidents and other leaders committing to actions to help more students graduate college. Most recently, he was president of the Institute for College Access and Success, TICUS, a research and advocacy nonprofit focused on higher education affordability, accountability, and equity, and one of California Competes' partners. Qual went to college in California and is a fellow cardinal graduating from Stanford University. He then went on to get a law degree from Harvard. Okay, let's get on with the interview to hear from Undersecretary Qual. Thanks, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, we're really happy that we got you out here to Sacramento um, for the 10th anniversary and we're able to cover the time to do this interview. Um, so we have just a few questions just to love to learn about, I guess, you, your journey, and then your vision for higher education in the country, what sure. it means for California, all that good stuff. Sure. Um, so let's kick off. Like Everyone has their journey. Um, will you share with us what was your journey to becoming Undersecretary of Education for the U.S. Um, and how did that experience shape how you view higher education and workforce policy? Sure. Well, I was uh, very fortunate growing up. My parents made sacrifices. I had an excellent uh, public school system that I went to. I went to um, some very good universities and I knew that um, those opportunities that they created for me, you know, gave me a lot of choices. And, you know, that's something that I think every young person should have is that same kind of opportunity and education and choices in their career. And so when I graduated from college, I moved to Washington and I started working on um, student financial aid um, at the Department of Education. And I've been in, edu in Washington for a while now. I've worked um, on higher education quite a bit and I've also worked more generally on domestic policy. And uh, I keep coming back to higher education because I think that you know, the challenges our country faces around stagnant incomes, around a lack of equitable opportunity, around an inability to understand each other. All of those things are things that higher education has to be a big part of the answer. So I just think um, building the higher education system that we need that lives up to its potential is one of the most important things we could do for our future. Yeah, I agree. Like the, the higher ed thread seems to go across all of our right. our nations and our states issues even if it doesn't feel like a higher red specific issue right yeah. right um so you were confirmed as the undersecretary in 2021 how has how's it been so far oh it's been really invigorating like we have an incredible team at the department of education we have uh really talented both political and career staff and uh we're doing an incredible amount we're working really hard on um making student loans more affordable, on increasing scholarship access, um, on trying to do a better job running the programs, getting the students the benefits they're entitled to. Um, and then Secretary Cardona has also asked us to look at, you know, how do we build a system of higher education that values inclusivity, um, that functions as a reliable path of upward mobility. Um, and that's a really broad and, and exciting mandate to have. You mentioned in there like executing the programs and, and doing that with fidelity. And I think one of the things that I've been seeing a lot amongst, you know, friends and in social media media is the, the public service loan yeah. forgiveness and the excitement people get when they see that that program works. Um, and so I think that's one thing is, you know, as policy folks, we think a lot about like new solutions, but thinking about how do we get the solutions that we've already implemented to actually be implemented well um, is really critical too. Yeah, I agree. There's a tendency as a policy person to think, okay, we did it, we solved it, now we'll hand it over to uh, the people who implement it. And one of the things that we found when we started a year ago was all these borrowers who are eligible to have their loans canceled, whether they were in public service 
or they were disabled, or they had been cheated by their college, but their applications were still pending at the department. When we knew, based on the information we had, that they should have had their loans canceled. So trying to move through that, we've done uh, 680,000 borrowers so far, and wow. that's just such an important part of um, you know, making the student loan program work for borrowers is getting them the relief that they're entitled to. That's insane. Yeah. Wow. Um, so as I mentioned in your bio, you used to lead the Institute for College Access and Success, TICUS, one of our partners. Um, can you talk about the importance of data and research for informing policymaking and collective change? And I know that was a core part of TICUS's work is bringing that really rigorous evidence to bear. Yeah, it's really an important tool for policymakers, I think, because, you know, when you're in a government job, it's just fire drill after fire drill. It's hard to look down the road. And something that a place like TCUS or that California Competes can do is to, you know, think in a bigger picture way. What are our long term objectives? Um, what are the research and data that can inform the path to get there? What are the concrete steps? Um, and that, you know, and I think one of the great things that we tried to do at TCUS that California Competes does is, you know, produce information that um, is just so reliable that you know you can count on it. So you don't need to fact check it or do your own research. You can take, um, you can take that fact, you can take that recommendation and run with it. And that's, you know, just, um, I think, such an important way to have an impact um, on policymakers. Can you talk a little bit about what makes that work reliable and trustworthy? Yeah, I mean, I think it is, one thing is just gotta be um, empirically sound. And, um, you know, you have to um, produce factual analysis that is even handed and try and resist the temptation to um, stack the deck. You want to acknowledge contrary evidence, I think, because that really makes your conclusion that much more persuasive. Um, and it will stand up as their recommendations get into the back and forth in the policy process. And then the other thing is having, you know, policy recommendations that, um, you know, keep the big picture in mind, but also think about the tools and the moment and how you can make concrete steps in ways that are operational, um, can be operationalized. Um, so having that sort of careful recommendations about how to get from here to there, I think is something California Competes does really well. So right now in California, we are in the process of standing up a statewide longitudinal yeah. data system, the cradle to career data system, which I know is something that when you were leading TICUS, TICUS supported and advocated for the launch of. Right. Um, so given your bird's eye view on, on our, you know, the states across the US, the various integrated data systems that exist and realizing that California is one of the last states to, to set one up, what words of wisdom do you have for California um, as we move forward? Well, I'm so excited that you all are doing this and congratulations. I know Thank it's you. something California Competes has worked on for a really long time. And you know, if you want to know um, whether students are reaching their goals, you have to look at data. You have to look at whether they are or are not. And a lot of the educational system um, depends on um, passage of students from one school to the next into the workforce. And so to say, as a college, you know, preparing students for college level work, as a community college student um, going to successfully transfer and graduate from a four year university, you know, you need longitudinal data in order to feed, to provide that feedback back to um, schools. So it's really, really important. You know, I think you want to be looking carefully at how to structure the data that is actionable and most important to drive improvement. Um, everyone is going to have questions that they want to answer. Um, so you need to think very carefully about um, what is the stuff that's really going to have an impact on um, decision making by institutions or by students. And then the second thing is to really make sure that you're focusing not just on the averages, but you're disaggregating the data because we know that um, different students can have very different experiences. Often, um, you know, low income students, students of color, first gen students can face additional obstacles. So even if a particular college or particular program has a high graduation rate or seems to be sending people into the workforce. That's not necessarily true for all students. So we can't just be looking at the averages. We need to be disaggregating that data. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so higher education enrollment has declined during the pandemic. And I think this was a little bit of a surprise for many people. Um, and one thing that 
to higher ed advocates and researchers are, you know, and policymakers are very concerned about. Um, California is not immune to this trend. Can you discuss how the U.S. Department of Education, how you guys are thinking about addressing this issue, if there's any initiatives currently underway or will soon be underway, um, in thinking about how do we address this enrollment decline? Yeah, it's definitely a concern. I mean, nationally, enrollment is down by close to a million students. And, you know, you have to worry that um, those students won't get back on track and you'll have a permanent dent in our country's educational attainment that, um, you know, could be uh, have an impact on our society for decades to come. Um, you know, I know that some schools are seeing a rebound in applications this year. Um, we still see FAFSA applications are down again this year. Uh, uh, lower share of high school students we project to complete a FAFSA this year. Um, so I think we, one, we need to make sure that high school seniors know that this is a good time to continue their education, that they should be going back to campus this fall. Uh, I think it is another reason to pay really careful attention to retaining students um, and trying to bring back students. I know some colleges are, for example, waiving fee fees and fines that are really penny wise, pound foolish because they can be a barrier. And we need to think much more carefully about the needs of adult students who you know, really need to be served in ways that are different, that are um, fast, um, and that provide real payoff, and that provide flexibility in schedules. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't just go back to 2019 and think these problems are going to heal themselves. We really got to pay attention to um, the, the things we need to do to serve students well in 2022 and beyond. The, the sort of institutional level debt or, you know, forgiveness is something that we've also advocated for. Okay. And I know you visited Sac State earlier today yeah. and it's a policy that they recently- They were telling me about that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, it just makes so much sense, you know? Right. Um, so let's shift a little bit to talking about the Build Back Better plan. Um, so a big piece of that is increasing the capacity of existing workforce systems and creating better higher education and workforce alignment to support our economic recovery. Can you share a little bit about the administration's plan for tackling career readiness and strengthening the country's ability to meet workforce needs? Yeah, I mean, this is something that's really important to the secretary. And, and he reminds us that, you know, students are going back to school, not just to get a diploma, but to um, achieve something, usually um, to get the career or the job that they want. So it's really important for us to be paying attention to those outcomes. Um, you know, we're seeking funding to help community colleges work directly with employers and design um, uh, programs to meet the needs of not just a single employer, but a sector of employers or an industry. Um, those are the kinds of things that we see really paying off. Um, career programs are often uh, more expensive for a community college to offer, so we need to make sure we're providing that kind of funding. Um, the other thing that we really see is this is an area where the policy response is really fragmented and stovepipes uh, really get in the way of students trying to navigate this system. Um, so we're working really hard both with our K-12 colleagues to try and integrate career education, including you know, early college opportunities um, in high school. Um, and we're also working regularly with our colleagues at the Labor Department and the Commerce Department because our concern is those stovepipes get created at the federal level and then they get replicated at the state level or the local level. So we think it's really important for us to model that kind of collaboration. You touched on a couple of things that are California Computes' priorities right now. I'd love to hear you talk more. We are grappling with these. Um, also, the, the higher ed employer engagement piece. And I feel like this is you know a perennial issue. How do you get higher ed to engage with employers and vice versa? Um, have you seen anything that really works? Or you know, I guess, how are you thinking about pushing forward like these authentic relationships that you know center around student success. Yeah, it can be challenging. I mean, you need to make sure that employers see colleges as part of the solution. Um, you know, I think more and more they are. Um, and it's exciting to see places. Um, you know, some very large employers have created partnerships with colleges to try and um, offer new educational opportunities to their workers, whether to gain promotion at their job, or even in some cases as a stepping stone to other jobs and other careers. Um, so I think that's really exciting, you know. And um, you know, the president will be 
uh, talking more about it tonight, the State of the Union is tonight. And he sees um, higher education as a really important part of our response to the moment we're in, where we're trying to um, grow the middle class, uh, strengthen our supply chains, strengthen our domestic manufacturing. Um, so all of those are real priorities for the administration. Yeah. Again, the threat of higher ed across, across the There you go, exactly. Um, so another component of the plan focuses on childcare. Um, and California has many student parents, and frankly, for the number of adults that we need to go to college, most of them have dependent children. So figuring out how do we how do we better serve student parents is something that California Competes has been very focused on. Um, how is the administration working to expand pathways for student parents and to address the needs to improve their college success? Yeah, really important question, because if you're talking about trying to give students on ramps at different points in their lives and serving adults, you know, childcare is part of the, is part of the question. Um, I think you will hear the president talk about tonight, uh, some of his plans for childcare, and um, hopefully Congress will be persuaded that those are smart investments uh, to make. I hope they will. Um, you know, in the meantime, we're working very hard on an interagency basis there too. So we wanna make sure that um, other agencies understand that um, this is the reality of who college students are now, and that if we um, help students get through school, you know, we're creating a lot of opportunities for self-sufficiency going forward. So it can be a really smart investment to help student parents get childcare, get SNAP, get the other types of benefits that they're eligible for. Um, so we're, you know, we're trying to be as helpful as we can, um, both in talking to our colleagues in Washington and also talking to colleges about the types of benefits that students may be eligible for. Yeah, it really getting, again, that, that, that sort of implementation execution. Right. We have these things that are already in place. Let's make sure that people that are eligible for it actually get it. Right, um, and often with federal dollars. So for states, it's a, you know, if you can get a student SNAP benefits, that's hundreds of dollars a month and it's all federal money, so it's a, it's a win. Yeah, I love that. Um, and then thinking about the, the the ripple effect also of if you support the the student parent, it also supports the, their child. It's it, a great point. It makes yeah. Um, yeah. so much sense. And in California, where our post secondary public post secondary tuition is so low, childcare is more expensive wow. than tuition. Wow. Um, and we a preview of our, our post secondary prosperity dashboard update. We're including childcare affordability metrics, um, and it is almost universally unaffordable. Wow. Everyone in our state. Wow. It's insane, the cost of childcare. Um, and that's if you can get it. Right, right. Um, so another thing we've been thinking about as we think about how to better serve adult learners is we have a study that looks at the demand for higher ed in California. Um, and the demand for higher ed is huge. We find that one in five Californian adults say they intend to enroll in college in the next two years, and that a third of them prefer exclusively online courses. Wow. And this is something that surprised us. And then we thought, how do we make sure this leads to good outcomes for students? Um, so I would love to hear, what do you see as the future for online or hybrid higher education? Um, and how do we strengthen the, the digital infrastructure that so that everyone has equitable right. broadband access? Right. I mean, I think that future is being written right now. Um, one thing we know is uh, people don't want to go back to 2019 in a lot of ways. So I think there will continue to be um, greater demand for online and hybrid and flexible options. Um, in some ways, that's great uh, for working adults, for working parents. That can be great to have that flexibility. Um, you know, if done well, um, online education can help people master material more quickly, can help us um, measure the effectiveness of pedagogy um, in a way that's hard to do in the classroom. Um, but we also know there are some things that online is not as well suited for. There are some types of subjects or occupations, um, and there are some learners who do better in person who want that additional support. So I think we need to be really careful about um, not trying to simplify this into online good or bad, but how do you think about the purposes of how online is used? And you know, you make a really important point that in many ways the pandemic, uh, the tide came out and we saw a lot of the inequities that were already there in terms of access to broadband, access to laptops, access to safe and quiet places to do work. So we can't 
lose sight of the extra effort to make sure those opportunities are equitable. Yeah, and the, the tie went out. Um, okay, so my last question is looking ahead, what, are, what priorities do you have for higher education in the US or the administration? Well, we're working on, I would say, three main uh, areas of priorities. One is we've talked some about the pandemic recovery, and hopefully we're making progress uh, as a public health matter. Um, but we do know we have the missing enrollment. We have students with um, academic gaps, with mental health needs. So we have a long road back, and we can't lose focus on that. Um, the second thing that we're thinking a lot about is student loans. And um, student loans have become a really important part of how people pay for college. Um, but we also know a lot of people are struggling with their loans. In some cases, people are worse off than if they hadn't gone to college at all when they're left with a debt. So we need to make sure college is more affordable up front, and we need to make sure that we're getting students relief when they can't afford to pay their loans for a number of reasons. And then the third thing we're trying to think about is how do we build a system of higher education that um, invest in the institutions that are committed to being inclusive, um, that are working hard to help more students graduate and reach their goals. Um, how do we help them use data and evidence? And you know, how do we elevate the prestige of that work? Um, because our, our national conversation tends to revolve around a relatively small number of colleges and universities that are defined by their selectivity. And what our country needs is you know, countries, uh, uh, colleges and universities that are committed to serving their institutions that uh, look like their communities um, and that help, you know, many more students reach their goals. So that's really the important work that we should be investing in and we should be honoring. Well, I, I, I love that vision and um, I hope California will do its part for the country and, and meeting those goals. I know that for many of the, the orgs like California Competes and our peers, um, and for many of our state policymakers, we share those, <laughs> those aspirations, and I, I hopefully can get there. Yeah, I think we can together. California, of course, has been a, you know, a model in higher education in so many ways, and I think they're ahead of the curve on this, too. Yeah, I sometimes forget that as we focus on problems here, that yeah. you know, we actually have a pretty good system. You do. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, you do. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me today um, for this conversation and, and sharing your journey and your insights and your vision for, for higher education. Thanks so much for having me, Sujana. It was fun. Yeah.